Uh, it will be available to you by an email. They'll send you a link, and we'll have that set up that way after, after the meeting. So what we're going to do today is talk about some tools and methods. I haven't had a webinar since, um, I think, August. And I've been planning on doing one once a month, so whenever I have time, I'll get it in. Uh, September was a very busy month, and so was August. But um, we have one now in November. So what we're going to talk about today, we're going to talk about running cables through loops. We're going to talk about a forgotten tool. A, a company in Britain uh, asked me to uh, talk about uh, solid bus runs. So we're going to talk about solid bus runs. I don't know who all is using them. I think some in, in North America are using that. Uh, I'd like to go over the elevations and leads with the ground grid. With the new 7.1 up to update, I think the improvements in the ground grid are uh, really worthwhile talking about again and making sure everybody knows. And the last thing I want to bring up is an adaptive fence method. I've had questions on fencing uh, for, for a number of years, and uh, I'm going to show them my method of fencing. Uh, it's not necessarily the best way because the best way is whatever you guys use in your companies. But I really think uh, an adaptive fence and uh, what I would be doing is a very good way. And I would recommend everyone to look at it and consider it. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to run some cables through loops. So let's look at that. So the first thing I'm looking at is I have two um, islands. I have a, uh, an island here and an island here. Uh, what I have in here is, of course, I like to leave my points turned on. I like to see my points and my parts, uh, mainly because I want to see where I'm connecting to, whether it's with cables or bus or even conduit and trench. We use a lot of points to identify ends. So I like to leave my points on, and I put my points on. What I also do with my points is I make sure, and I, if you go through any training with, with me, I talk a little bit about this, is I like to have my annotation size large. Um, here I got two, usually it's 1.8, whatever you do. Um, but I want it large enough so I can see those points. If they're too small and I, and I come into something, I can't see the points at all. Let's see here. Right. If it's too small, I would not see the points sticking out in the back here. So I like my points fairly big. And that's why you see them that size. So what I want to do is talk about creating something like this cable. If you look at this cable, it loops around and comes over here. What we also do with, the, with this type of thing is if I need to show slack in a cable, I'm going to spin it around here. I love this 3D mouse. I'm going to spin it around and look at the slack in this cable. Every direction of look of this cable shows slack in this cable because in this case, the customer wanted slack in that cable. You can see how that cable is, is slack. Let's get on to part priority. You can see how that has a bend in it no matter which way I look at it. So there's a couple things we want to do, do, do there. So what I'm first going to show is what we want to do is to create this loop, we have to go by pick points. I'm going, to, I'm going to put a cable in, and then we're going to look at the loop tool. So I'm going to add pick points, add cable. So I'm going to first look, first look at my settings and check that I got the right cable in here. I have an 8% sag. You know, when it's this short, the sag doesn't really matter. But adding some sort of sag is worthwhile to make it look real. So I got 750 M MCM, so let's take that. And I'm just going to run points, and it takes a minute to run points. When we first brought out as S SDS, the pick points was a maximum of 10 points. And then uh, a couple years ago, we've uh, expanded it to be able to hit, I believe, infinite points. I haven't had a case where I had to pick um, more than an infinite. <laughs> But I haven't ran out of picks yet. If you look at this tool I have here, it's just eight points in a circle, basically. And uh, I'll show you. I'll, I'll break down that circle in a little bit. But I just want to show you running the cable. So I'm going to pick this point to run the cable. 
pick the outside and now I'm going to pick the other cable, the other point on the inside and I'm going to come up. I'm going to come up here and I'm, I'm, I'm making a path for this cable to be run. I got my big, I got my big points that I want to select. I don't know why I didn't want to select that one. And we can run that cable. All right. So I shouldn't have picked the one down here, so I would have to rerun that cable. But in the meantime, maybe that's what we do want. But I'm, I'm not a big fan of that. I would rerun that cable. But we have that now. I'm going to save it. And yes, SDS, of course, SDS will pick up the length of that cable and will calculate the loop and the total length of that cable. But let's look at that cable part. So if we look in the menu or in the browser, we can find that cable. Here's our cables, and here's my loop tool. If you look at the loop tool, I put it in a pattern because I just wanted it uh, spaced equal distance, a little bit to the inside on the outside. So let's look at the tool. So what we have is a tool like this. I'm going to take this extrusion. I'm going to uh, make it visible. Why didn't it go visible? Let's unsuppress it, I guess. Okay, there's my extrusion. I just have this little extrusion here, and it's just a marker for for me to see what I'm doing. What I've done with this this tool is I've I placed it on my origin planes. If you'd follow the substation modeling strategy, you can see that I have the tool around the origin planes. I have a spacing between those points. You can see the spacing between those points, and I placed it so that I know what height I am above the XY plane. So that when I place this tool in here, I can I know the height above my XY plane and as a reference. That's the way I do it. I, I like that idea because I'm sure of my heights are going to be equal for all of them and where I place them. So I have that tool and I'm, I'm placing these points in here. To get these points in here, what I have is two other uh, work planes. I got a work plane here for the height, and I got a work plane here for um, the other. Um, let's change that to auto resize. Oh, I change that. And you can see how that plane is sitting there. So I got these points on that plane, and that's where I've uh, placed those points. If I want to look at that sketch, there's my sketch. So I'm actually pointing, putting points on a sketch to create that circle. I could put more points on that circle. I can change the diameter of the diameter of the circle and come up here and look at the functions. And I can look at the height is 152 above my XY plane. My diameter is 32 because that's the size I wanted. So I'm driving it from here so I know um, so I know what the um, the distance is above the XY plane. I just, in my mind, I like that idea. I put in the cable diameter because what I'm doing actually when I'm passing through here, I'm passing the cable around itself and I don't want it to collide at all. I want that gap in here and I can adjust that gap with the loop tool. So if I were to adjust that gap now, adjust the diameter, I can up, update the cable and it will show accordingly. This extrusion here I just have as a surface extrusion. It's just for my reference. It just, um, just gives me an idea on where things are if I need it. But typically I would have that visibility off. So that's the loop tool. If we come in here and we change that loop tool, let's change our diameter from 32 to 36. And maybe the cable diameter is 1.25, and that will give us a bigger space between the 
between the points and I'll save that. Now, when we come into here, I can see that my loop tool is bigger. You can see how the cable isn't pat passing through there anymore. And now I can up, up update my cables. So I'm gonna save this, of course, before I do anything. And I'm gonna update the cable. All right, and you can see it has updated the cable. I'm not using update all cables because I have a lot of cables in here and I don't want to spend the time waiting for the software to catch up to it. So you can see how that cable loop tool is done. So we've added those loops. Well, where else we may want to do that, like I said, is on these slack lines. I want to show a slack in here as well, right? So let's look at the cable loop tool or the cable slack tool in this case and on uh, that assembly. So let's open up that assembly. Because I want it on islands, I want everything contained to the island as what we talk about in the, in the substation mod modeling strategy. And let's look at that cable spacer. Is that the tool? I believe it is. All right. So this is the tool I made, I made for here. It's just two points. But what I want to do is use this as a pass-through tool. And if we come into the, um, the automation requirements for a pass-through tool, right? If we come into the automation requirements for a pass-through tool, we, we can see what we need for a pass-through. We need work points, cables. This document, of course, is available for download once you log into our website. And you can download this document and and, uh, and study it. So this is, this is the type of information we need on there. So we, that's what we have. We have cable one, cable two, cable access, and we can create this and make that usable for um, passing through. But what we need in this case is something to select. So I, I made a surface extrusion. A surface extrusion is just normal inventor stuff. Um, I'm just using ex surface instead of um, a uh, solid, but I need something to pick. So that's what it is. And of course, I've, I've done it the same same way with the XY plane on the uh, top of concrete idea. So that's what puts me in here to have this surface tool in here. You can see that is in there. Now I can place that exactly where I want it to be to create that slack. If you look at it, it's six by six. Well, if you know, if I go six by six on a triangle, you know it's a 45 degrees, but it's actually slacked in both directions. So now if I, I place that cable in here, I can place that cable in here. I can come up to my above grade tools, pick fittings to add cable, and I can pick my fittings. And I needed that surface to make sure I pick my fittings. So it's gonna go through there and it's gonna put my pieces in there. Now, in this case, you can see how I have a uh, spacer up and above. I didn't pick the right spacer, but uh, I, I should have picked this, the same spacer as this one here for, 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 uh, for these guys. So I could delete that and rerun it. But what in this case I'm showing you is that I can run this. Uh, I have spacers on either side. I may not want a spacer here. But if I only wanted one spacer, I can actually use a spacer as a um, as a fitting. So if I did that again and I came here and I picked this fitting, picked this this spacer, and ran that, I can go through the spacer as well. So there's going to be at times it's going to be dependent on which way you want you want to do things. If you know, I needed a spacer in the middle, I can make sure I set my settings so I don't have any spacers in there and run that again. So if I come up to my settings and make sure I don't have any spacers, I'm just gonna put large numbers in here. And this is where I could have picked the proper spacer on the first one. I can run that again. We're gonna pick, pick fittings and we're gonna come through here. And now I only have the cable through that spacer. So there's different methods of doing this. And what I'm just trying to show you is different ways to run cable, different tools that we can use to do this. 
Um, it's not just for loop tools or for Slack. Something like this here, year, years ago, I, I worked on this model here. Oh, on this model here, and you zoom in, I needed to put a, a tool of points in here. So these, these um, let's get in, see how much I can zoom in on this silly thing. You can see how these cables come drop, drape down underneath the structure here. And I, I use the cable loop tool to put those that, that loop in there as well. So there's different places where you want to use that cable loop tool. Now we're going to have questions at the end of this. So I'm going to keep going with this type of idea. So that's, a, uh, I call it a cable loop tool because that's a habit of mine, but it's a cable tool for adding slack, adding a path. Maybe it's a cable path tool. Maybe that's a better term. But let's look at our top assembly here again. And let's look at our bus. Well, where else can we do something like this? Well, here's a, a bus tool. I just placed a bus. What if, what if I need to come up with some bus ends or something? I have no idea offhand, but I can do that. With the new 7.1, we have the bus tool that allows us to um, have different lengths on either end of the bus, but we may want further detail or further information, or we want a point that we don't want to cross our uh, dependencies from one island to another uh, for constraints and such as that. You never want to have constrained parts in one island or one subassembly to another subassembly. You don't want to constrain parts that way. So. Maybe this would it would help in certain situations. So I'm going to change the round bus. I want it, I think it's four inch. I don't know what it is offhand. Let's go with what this is. I don't like the 2018 tool here. I don't know what it's telling me. It looks like three and a half in, inches. So maybe I want it smaller. Let's go back to my bus. Let's see what we get with this. But now I can run my fittings to add bus. I can run this fitting to this fitting. And there's my bus. Okay. So what I'm getting now is that I'm still having my offset from those points as here, but I I had to have I could pick a fitting out here. Now I could have picked this fitting and this fitting and then calculated how much offset I wanted. But either or, I'm just showing you an example with with that. If I come into here and if we look at that bus fitting tool, it's just doing the same thing as what I did with the cable fittings. I need something to select so I have a surface to select. So I extruded a surface, just normal adventure practice. And if you look at my origin plane, again, I have it on, on, on the XY plane. And that way it's consistent. If I'm using this again somewhere else, I have that distance above 100, 152 inches above, so I don't have to put that number again and offset it and calculate it again. That's one way of looking at it, but you don't necessarily need it. You can have it completely floating and command it, command it when you uh, constrain it in your next higher assembly. And again, I'm just following the uh, what we need. We got a bus and a bus axis in here. So that's a little bit of on a cable loop tool and bus access tool. And I was thinking when I was doing this work that, uh, well, where else would something like this come in handy? And I, and I know I've done a lot of lightning stuff. So let's look at some lightning. I'm going to browse to that. I can't believe it's 24 minutes past already. Let's look at a lightning example. Included project is missing because of uh, I use it uh, the Inventure tool. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the Inventure tool, iLogic Copy Design. It's a great tool for copying it outside, copying an assembly outside of Vault. So let's come into here. I'm going to open up this Lightning assembly, and the same idea of putting four points because Lightning works on points as well. We can select masks or points. And if you're working with some lightning and trying to come up with an idea on uh, 
where to put your masts and you don't want to build a mast and stick it and start playing with it. I'm thinking of this type of thing of doing it is just putting four points on the plane, right? This plane, I put it on an angle or did I? Oh, I put it on the angle in the assembly. So I put four points on uh, this plane and then I just pick points. I put this angle. I I, uh, con I constrained it on a 15 degree angle. So I, 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 I put that plane in here and I ran it here. So it's just an idea. I don't know how useful it's going to be, but to me, when I'm looking at lightning, I don't know where my mass should go and I may have to play with them. And maybe I want to put points in, play with the points. And then I, then I have an idea of how to, I can develop my lightning mast locations by putting my points in, and then after that, I can put my uh, my lightning mast in and put and put work points on the top of my light lightning mast. By the way, I find it I like it better running with uh, picking uh, points rather than mast for my lightning. So you guys may find that as well. So the other thing I wanted to look at is the Forgotten tool, solid bus path. So let's go look at solid bus path. So tools and methods, I'm gonna come down this project file. And we're gonna open up this general arrangement. This is a demo tool that I have. I look at this, I use this a lot uh, for problem solving. I just run, I run things through here. I use it for demonstrations for, for other companies. They wanna see things. So let's look at um, the B. What I'm gonna do is run a couple solid bus pieces in here. So I'm gonna look at my browser. I got lightning protection. I got all my uh, assemblies and bays all separate. And I'm gonna come into my bay and I'm gonna open my bay. And here we have is some um, cable uh, solid bus. That's what we're looking at. You can see the solid bus pieces in here. And that's how it how it's done. So uh, I have forgotten about this tool, and I was asked by uh, a company in Britain about it. So let's put the solid bus in here. I'm going to pick my bus. I'm going to pick my default round round bus to a one inch bus, and I'm going to save it. Put this at zero zero. I may not need that, but uh, I want to be sure. And I'm going to pick two fittings to add my bus. I'm going to pick this fitting, and I'm going to go to this fitting. And you can see how that bus is added. It's added. It's fitted. Um, it does it way better than I would do in, in the real world. Uh, I've fitted a fair amount of copper pipe, and this is a lot easier doing it on here, I tell you. Um, anyway, what this does, too, is give you the length in feet. So, so you have the length of, of this piece as well, it's six feet long. So we have the length, so it's accumulated properly and it's placed in accordingly like that. Uh, one thing to be aware of when you're running this, if I look at one of these fittings, if I look at the fitting, what we need to add is a bus guide, right? So there's an extra point in here. We got the bus point, here, let's open it. It'd be easier. We have the we have a bus we have the bus point down where where the termination is down here, and we have the bus guide. And this fitting here, I I'm using dual purpose for a bus as well as a terminal stud, so I can attach this to a to a stud, or I can place it as a NEMA pad to a um, a fitting for running bus, just like I did here. So it's kind of a nice tool to put this in. I'm going to run this, and I'm going to come pick point, pick point, and there it is. All right? If I pick point in, in the center, I can do that as well. So that's the forgotten tool. And there's our point in, in the center, and all the lengths are calculated in there. So I'm going to leave that alone. And um, again, we'll have questions afterwards and we can talk about that in a minute or two. I want to get through these couple things here. 
and I'm running 2018. It doesn't matter if you're in 2017, 2016, whatever SDS is running, all the, these tools are available. That's a great thing about the SDS tool. You don't have to uh, ride the treadmill of updates. The other thing I wanted to look at is ground grids. Uh, the the 7.1 changes, uh, I think, were really good for the ground grid. Let's look at the ground grid here. In this case, you can see I have two levels of ground grid. It's in the same assembly. I also have the ground grid. I played around with it, and I decided, well, let's be goofy with it, and let's bend it around the uh, uh, foundations. And that's what I did here. So let's look at what that looks like. So again, I'll go into my underground assembly because I'm following the substation design modeling strategy. And I'm going to open up the ground grid. And let's open that guy up. <clears throat> and what we see here, it's, it's difficult to see um, with the, um, the size of the scale and whatnot. I have two ground grids in here. And if you look in the browser, I have a ground grid sketch here and a sketch here. These sketches are on different planes, right? And what I've, what I've done here is to show it in this manner. So to, uh, to make it obvious that we can put now the ground grid below the plane we are, we're selecting a sketch on. We can put the ground grid on different planes. It doesn't have to be always on the XY plane in the past. That's the way it was 7.1. And uh, coming up to 7.1 started allowing us to offset our ground, our ground grid location or put it on any sketch on any plane. So I really like that tool, uh, getting to that point. What it's allowing us to do is put bends in our sketch. So I have some radius in here if I edit that sketch. And of course, you could bring it in from uh, AutoCAD too. But you can see how I, I put bends in that sketch and I've just worked with it like that. And that's our uh, ground grid in, in here and it's able to do that. On the ends here, what we have is uh, the leads in here. And before 7.1 came out, these leads were uh, measured as in the bill of material as each and not as linear length feet. Uh, in this case, I can delete this guy and if I wanted to put that in here, I'm going to show you the method, the below grade method. And I am going to go into this window, come over here, added options, and I'm going to connect grid elements end to end. So I can grab that circle face here, the circle face here, and there's my cable. So there's my cable in there. It's measured in length and feet and I'm able to tie my ground grids together. I really think for me, this is a great little tool, allows to allow a little tool, great, good, big tool, <laughs> but it's a great tool to get into different elevations of grids. Um, a lot of times I'm, I've stitched grids together and it's been a tedious task and now I can have a, a, a grid with, with many different levels all in one file if I needed to. I really like that. While I was working with this, I wanted to show one more thing with this and uh, ground grids and elevations. I should show the elevations tool just so you guys see it for those who aren't familiar. If I come into the tool here, if I want on different elevations, I got three choices here in this tool. So this is in the generate ground grid window. I can come in here, create elements on the sketch plane, create grid elements on zero containing the sketch, or create it on depth of grid. And depth of grid is based on this dimension here, negative dimension. So this is how we can get it offset. If you go depth of grid, it's going to be offset of your work plane. Wherever your sketch is, it will be offset by that number of inches. Uh, it will create it on the sketch plane regardless of where your plane is in the elevation. So you put the sketch on the plane and put your ground grid below it or put your sketch on the plane and move your plane to the depth you want it. 
or it would just go to zero. So you got the three uh, the three choices here. So I think that's a really good choices for being able to play around with your ground grids. But I wanted to also show you something while I was while I was putting this together. I wanted to show this aspect of um, placing a lead in here. So let's put a lead in here. I'm going to create a ground lead. I'm going to create a lead from that lead to that top. And I'm going to say that's my grounding item. And we should be able to put that lead in there. So that's fine and, fine and dandy. And by the way, with 7.1, that is surely in the length and feet. You can see it's adding a prefix because I put my settings to add a prefix to the ground lead. We can do that now. It doesn't need to say prefix and say whatever you want. But anyway, what I want to get at is this is not where I want it. And thank you, Autodesk. Not happy. Anyone knows me who've done live demos with me? Uh, always something happens. I'm sure some people are smiling out there. Let's come back into that demo assembly. I'm going to make sure I save it. I'm going to run that lead again, and I'll, I'll get to the point what I wanted to show you. This is where we need music or something to pass the time. All right. So what I did was run a ground lead. So let's run that ground lead again. Auto root. Create ground lead. Sometimes if you go too fast with Inventor and your software doesn't catch up, it does it not behave the way you want it to behave. Done. And save. Hurry, hurry, save. Okay, so let's get out of that command. So, well, I saved it this time, so I have it. Um, I'm in 2018, and I think I have the latest updates in my inventor. I'm going to have to double check what's going on there. And like those who I worked with in the past, I will say, you know, I practiced this. I ran this before I did this, and it worked fine. So maybe I'll blame it on GoToMeeting. I've turned off my um, Dropbox, so that's not interfering. Okay, so there's our, our cable. All right, and we saved it. What I'm trying to get at is I don't like where this location is. It is in my top assembly. It's a grounded element, so a lot of our um, our cables, or all our cables are grounded elements. So if it's grounded, it doesn't have any constraints to it. It is just locked in that position. So where I want that is in my grounding assembly. So let's look at my underground, come into my underground, and if you're using Vault, you gotta make sure everything is signed out and you have the ownership of everything before you do something like, like, like this. But I'm gonna go into my ground grid and expand it. And this is where I want that, this ground lead. I don't want it in that assembly, I want it in this assembly because I want all my ground, ground stuff together in one assembly. So I'm just going to grab it. And again, this is grounded. It's not constrained, so I don't have cross-constraint contamination. You don't want cross-constraints. And I'm talking about cross-constraints if you have a, a part in one assembly being constrained to parts inside of another assembly. You don't want that to happen, and we don't have that with SDS. Then that's intentional. That's a, that's a planned thing. But what I can do is grab this guy here. I'm going to move him up. And I'm going to stick him in this assembly now. And now he's out of my top assembly. 
and it is in my ground grid assembly. And we'll see it right there. And I can open that up and it's in there. So that's a, a nice little trick to help organize your trees. Because if you, if you look at my um, substation modeling strategy, if you go through my training, I talk specifically about keeping the, the trees organized. There's a, a section I talk about with that and keeping them small. Now, sometimes you can't keep them small. This is just an impossible task for this ground grid, but I can make several ground grids and stitch them together. But this is the piece I've, I've moved up into it, and now it's in this assembly. So now I have a nice, clean, organized assembly, even though I crashed three times to get there. All right, the last thing I want, wanted to talk about that's a ground grid review, reviews, and we'll do a couple questions, so we'll, we'll talk about that later. Uh, let's get out of this one. So we did everything but the fencing. We're going to look at some fencing. Again, this is being recorded, so you'll be able to watch it later, and you'll get an email on where it's being recorded, where, where, where to download the recording. Example, fence. It's coming in here. Let's open up the fence. So here is my fence assembly. Where is it? Fence assembly here. Okay, so what I do is adaptive fencing. I've been doing this adaptive fencing. I think uh, Josh remembers it from uh, long ago. Um, but uh, Josh is leading the consortium in the 3D side. Uh, him and I uh, were involved a number of years ago, and that's the way I set it up. So what I have here is a piece of fence, and let's look at what it looks like. I have it, this is a, an expanded metal fence, so you can see the um, what it looks like. Or we can have our barbed wire and chain link if we wanted, or if we wanted this on an angle, we can do that as well. It's all whatever you set up your model to be. So it's not a big deal either way. But let's look at what we want to do. I want to bring in a piece of fence and bring it in here. And let's see, um, I need a piece of fence here, need a piece of fence here. So let's look at adding a piece of fence here. So I'm going to come in here, I'm going to place a piece of fence. Um, let's see, expanded metal, your chain link. Let's open this guy. And put a piece of chain link in here. Here's my chain link. I'm going to make it adaptive. I'm going to take my chain link, and I'm going to take the axis the Z axis, I'm going to make that. Hold on. Make sure I do this right. Okay. So I want to make it over to this end. All right. So what I have here, to be clear, I have a fence skeleton because this is substation modeling strategy talks about skeleton. In the skeleton for the fence, I've, I've placed work axes at, at key points, and that's where I'm going to have a corner post. So my corner posts are going to be on those work axes. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to place this piece of fence I just placed in. I'm going to constrain that to, and so I've got my fence skeleton and my work axes. Let's find that guy. There it is there. Let's constrain that together. Now I'm going to constrain it. I know my X, Y planes are my reference planes. So I can just quickly go flush, come up to flush up here. Now I got my piece of fence, it's not aligned yet. So let's align it to my skeleton. So let's come back down here. I know how I've drawn this, so I can take that axis and constrain it to my skeleton. Now everything's constrained, I can't move that at all, right? But let's look at what I'm talking about adaptive. We have our little circle, blue red circle, meaning it's adaptive. What is adaptive is the work plane. This is a key point here, is that my work plane, my work geometry is adaptive. 
not my features, not my sketch, my work plan is. That is key. So let's come in here. I'll, I'll break that down in a minute, but let's constrain this work plane. I want to constrain it to my axis there and apply. And there is my fence stretched out accordingly. All right. Now my posts are I put in separately. In this case, I can make them adaptive, but it makes it very complex to make the posts adaptive, but it can do. I'm not using any eye logic here. This is just normal inventor practice to be able to do that. So let's take a look at my um, chain link adaptive uh, template. So here it is here. So I have all my work geometry at the top of my browser. They're all made from the origin. So it's a very robust piece. I have my N, N, N work plane NB and work plane NA. So NA is based on the origin, right? I have my origin planes. If I look at the origin planes, I have it offset by the diameter of the, uh, the largest post and the railing post, right? So I have the railing, I have three railings on here. So that's the way it's set up. It doesn't have to look exactly like this, whatever you guys set up, but the theory behind it is what I wanna talk about. If you look at the rails, let's look at the extrusion edit feature, it's extruded to, it's extruded to this NB, and the NB is what's adaptive. So if work plane NB moves, whatever length the um, it's going to be in the spacing, the feature, the extrusion of the rails is going to hit MB no matter where it goes. So it's the extrusion is dependent on the work plane, the work geometry. The work geometry is what is made it in the next higher assembly. This makes for a very robust extrusion, adaptive extrusion that's not going to break on you and it's not going to be upsetting. So there's a couple of things I, I did there. Um, when I extruded it, or when I constrained it, I constrained all my constraints first, and my last constraint was my adaptive constraint. So I, I made it to the to the post location on the skeleton. I don't have it dependent on the post itself. It's dependent on the skeleton. That way I can change the post, move the post, do all kinds of stuff. I have constrained it again to the skeleton for the height. And I've screened, I constrained it on the angle to the skeleton again. And these are the three main constraints, but now I add a fourth one for the length. And that gives me the length. If you look at the extrusion for the chain link side, it's the same thing. It's extruded to the work plane and it's the work plane that is adaptive. Now, what a lot of people don't want, and myself included, I don't want adaptive assemblies in my main model. Um, it can cause problems, it can slow things down. If something were to change and one was dependent on another one, next thing you know, you're, you're waiting 10 minutes for your drawing to up, update. So what I usually do with my fencing is that I will shrink wrap that fencing and put it through. So let's look at what we have for a bill of materials, because we're going to do this right that we want the bill of material to tell us what the heck's going on. So here's my model data. I have all my information here, all the files, and you look at almost everything's a phantom part, except for my fence pieces. And I'm given a length for each fence piece because it's extruded. I've set up my fence piece so that I have that length in there. So let's, you can see it's totalizing on my fence length because I didn't update this part number. It didn't totalize on this one. So let's get rid of that part number, make it the same as this part number up here. And now it's totalizing on there. So I have the total length of fence, whether it's expanded metal fence, I have 114, 189 feet of chain link. I have 3.5 cubic yards in total of foundation fence foundation for um, the normal size. That's one. Oh, the corner fence is a, a thicker one. So I'm totalizing my cubic yards. I'm totalizing my linear length of feet of fencing. 
and I have my total number of posts as well as in here. So I got my corner posts, my standard posts, my standard foundation, my corner foundation, chain length, total length, and this is a great output now. So when I look at the build of material in a drawing, let's save that. So if I come into my bill of material in the drawing, my bill is going to have the total length of feet of uh, fence I need. My bill is going to have the total no amount of concrete I need, right? So here's my bill. I have all all the lengths I want. I can reformat this. It doesn't have to show yards cubic three. This can be re reformatted normal inventor methods, right? And I have my summary. So if you're quoting to a, a vendor and saying, I don't need to tell them how many um, widgets and everything else, I just need so many feet of fence. This is a great way of doing it. This is one way of doing it. And then what again, I would, ex I would shrink wrap it into a separate part before I brought it into an assembly. If we look at the posts, I've made the post, each post in a assembly. So let's open up, oh, sorry. Let's open up a, yeah. The posts, I could make them adaptive too, but it's a complicated thing. And maybe I'd rather do it with iLogic than uh, adaptivity, I don't know. But the posts are a little more complex because it's an assembly and not a part, right? And then here, all I've done is set it up so that I put a length in. And again, this is normal inventor practice. There's no I logic, there's no goofiness going on. All it is is math. So here I got um, my, my, my overall spacing. I put in my overall spacing and it calculates the number of posts, the spacing of my last post, right? Here's my spacing of my last post. It's gonna be eight feet because I've got 10 feet as my maximum spacing. Whatever numbers you want to put in there, you can do it. It's just math. And that's how I set up the, the posts. And then when I put those in, I measure my point to point from my skeleton. And I know how long, how, what distance it is. I can go well, from here to here. It's 120, 1,000 1, inches. <laughs> but anyway, that's how you measure it out. And you can go from there. So it's, that is a method of fencing. There is a skeleton for the fence. I'm a big fan of skeletons. I use skeletons all over the place. Um, it's a great reference. Nothing is dependent on anything else in this case. And I think that is going to be it. It's 12.53, I'm seven minutes short. Um, I can, we can talk about this. I do uh, consulting stuff. Uh, you can talk to, I don't know, uh, SBS and they can set you up with the consulting and we can talk about this type of stuff as well. So what I've showed you today is three, four things is running cables through hoops, loops and hoops and sags and whatnot. We talked about the solid bus tool. We talked about um, the ground grid. I love the ground grid tools now. And we talked about the adaptive fence method. So if you guys got questions, I can take some questions and we can answer them. It doesn't have to be just on this stuff. I see the first questions from Jeremy and Jeremy is asking, how do you do Steve? Well, I'm doing quite fine. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, still upset about that crash, <laughs> but we'll go from there. Okay, Patrick, can you perform round bus placement using a path tool compatibility? to the loop tool. In other words, can you modify the paths? Presently on that solid bus routine, it calculates its own path right now, but it's not to say you can't um, join one solid bus to another and make your path. And that's not a bad tool to come. Um, I think you, you, that could be leveraged for a number of things, but most people don't um, run too much solid bus. Um, in a path of bending. So if you have a, a real uh, use for that, I'd like, I'd like to know where it's being used because that's kind of cool. It's a neat thought. So right now I have the two questions. 
if you guys, I'm surprised there's only two in the past. We've had quite a few. So I'm not sure if you guys want to ask more questions. Um, we'll leave it at that. Or, oh, here, here, we, here we come, Stephen. For the ground grid, what is the best method, in your opinion, of placing ground shots? The best method I, I, I use the tool to put the ground shots in. Are you talking about manually placing ground shots? That would be the question there. Okay, manually placing ground shots. I don't know of a way to manually place them other than, um, oh, you know what you could do? You could fool with the, um, you could uh, play with the uh, ground ground rod tool and place your, your shots in like a ground rod, uh, that type of thing. Uh, you could place your ground shots along the cable length by fooling the software, making your ground shot think that it is like a uh, a bus T. Put some bus T information in it, and then you could place it along the cable wire along that. Instead of 90 degree path, use a 45 degree path from a breaker to a switch. Again, that's uh, with the solid bus, and uh, it's right now it's only 90 degree paths or a bend radius or a large bend radius. Josh is saying he'd like to show me some pictures of using the solid bus tool. Are the fence parts available, or do we need to build them from scratch? How do you create the chain link and barbed wire surfaces? Well, that is just normal inventor practice. There's nothing really special about that. It's not SDS. Uh, if you want me to get in there and show you, that's um, a consulting issue, and uh, we can do that. I have no problem in doing that, but uh, that's the way it is. Uh, we don't use shots anymore. Can I change the look and parts required for compression fittings? Well, we can change the fittings, it's pretty tough to say we're going to change the look of it. Uh, I think there's a lot of work being done on the ground shots um, and methods. Uh, we need more input from the consortium. What I'm finding with the consortium is that most people are using parallel um, parallel um, um, molds, parallel um, fittings for the, uh, the the ground shots. What you can do, you can you can change the look of the part that it's putting in. You can take this, you can copy it out using the SDS tool. You follow these instructions. You make it look different so that when it when the ground shot is put in, it's going to look different. You can make sure it has different eye properties in it as well, and you can go from there. But as far as uh, the way the actual software is working, we don't have an option there yet. We need more input for that. All right. So we have some questions, and I believe that's it. It's 1256. I will stay on if you guys got more questions. I don't mind staying on. Will there be more upcoming webinars or video series on YouTube? I sure hope so. It's all all dependent on my time on how many web webinars I do. I like to do once a month, so I'll try and get another one for uh, before Christmas, and uh, we'll see what it does. Maybe 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 I'll do a Christmas one, and we'll do uh, we'll all sing jingle bells. But um, I will try and get another one before Christmas. Maybe, maybe the week there on this tenth. Uh, 11th of Christmas, maybe that week I'll, I'll, I'll get one in. Okay. Is there an option with the solid bus not to create 90 degree bends instead of 40 bends gradually from one side to the other point? Not yet. And I'm seeing a lot of input from this. See, this is a forgotten tool. I'm showing it and getting a ton of questions and interest. 
I love this. This is great. And now we can feed back and say, hey, people are using it and they're looking for this type of um, tool to run. So that's good. I'll uh, be bringing this up in, uh, in, in our discussions here with SDS. The fence stretching. Have you done this with solid wall fences, higher security? Well, yeah, the fence stretching, it's ad adaptive parts. I've done it with um, that, this method I'm showing based on uh, extruding, to a, a, extruding a feature to a work geometry. Uh, I've done it with uh, steel structure walls. I've done it with um, uh, uh, piping. I've done it with... Uh, uh, wet e electrostatic precipitators. <laughs> I've done it on a number of things. The method doesn't matter. Um, the method is what's important. What the part looks like doesn't matter. So yeah, you can uh, do it with any higher fences, whatever it's going to look like. You just change the look of it. Okay, how do we get access to models to try out the toolkits? Well, a good way to get access to models to try out the toolkits is to take the training and then you can download some um, items. I don't know how else to get um, access to models. Oh, when you buy the toolkit, there is a auto station that is part of the toolkit that you can start. I haven't ran that for a while. So get started, start a new project. And I believe this, no. Let's start up and open up an assembly. But I believe you can start a, um, there's a default assembly in here. I haven't looked at that for a long time. Here, station. Yeah. If you bring in this station, it should bring in a, um, a small trial station that you can play around with. If that doesn't work, get in contact with me again and um, we'll, uh, I'll, I'll set you up with a default one that comes with the software, but I'm quite certain this will come in and bring in a, um, a small station for you to play with. Uh, let's come into my email. Josh City sent me an email. So let's look at the email. Oh, I don't know what Josh, what are you sending me, Josh? Click the read message. All right, that's going to take some time. But if you take the training for uh, Substation Design Suite for Inventor, there's a whole bunch of models. The training, we actually get hands on. We get our hands dirty, if, it, if you can say dirty, by pushing a keyboard. But um, oh, I don't know, Josh, I got to have passwords and everything to look at your picture. So I'm going to leave that alone. Um, if, if you take the Substation Design Suite for Inventor training, we download uh, models and we actually get our hands um, dirty with uh, getting into models we work with uh, uh, from parts to assemblies to islands sub uh, sub assembly islands sub assembly bays we get into the skeleton modeling uh, we do the whole thing and then we get into actually running cable and met best methods of running cable running bus uh, and we uh, underground the conduit the trench everything we get into that so there's a fair amount in there and how to customize the software as well uh, typically, what people should have is experience with Inventor first before we go on, uh, before you get into the training. But when you take the training, there's a bunch of models that come with it, and that can be um, you can use for whatever purpose you want. All right. So I don't have all these passwords that I need for Josh's email. And I guess we're going to call it. I'm not seeing any more questions. I still have 24 people online. If you guys have questions, we can. I can go over something again. I still have time, so let me know. Otherwise, we'll close it. So I'll, I'll give you about 30 seconds, and then I'm going to close it.
We're down at 21. All right, I'm going to shut off the recording.